For the next talk, we have Dr. Sunil Menon with us. After completing his MD in respiratory medicine from Bombay University, Sir went on to specialize in the area of allergy and environmental medicine and nutritional medicine with various experts in the USA and UK. Dr. Menon is a member of the British Society of Lifestyle Medicine and is currently associated with the doctors in the US who practice a new approach in chronic disease management using a functional medicine model. He is presently working as a senior consultant at Sri Satyasai General Hospital, Prashanti Nilayam, where he has introduced 17 yoga clinics and is exploring ways in which integrative practices and nutritional medicine model can be used in the management of chronic disease in patients from the Indian subcontinent. Sir will be speaking to us on the impact of vitamin D status in COVID pandemic. Over to you, sir. Sairam. Sairam, everybody. Uh, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to address uh, all the students. But before I go into my talk, I would like to thank Dr. Uh, Srividya, the uh, head of the department, and her excellent team. And I would especially thank her for uh, inviting me uh, for this presentation. Uh, I would like to say that the previous presentation was so good that I was really engrossed with the facts that uh, Dr. Iyer has to give. So we go into this particular topic because everybody is worried. And researchers all over the world, they are looking for means to help people uh, stay off from the problems that the COVID virus causes. And basically improving your immune, immunity is one of the uh, tracks they've taken into. And they're focused on the micronutrient vitamin D. So what I'm going to present in this particular talk is something about vitamin D. And invariably, we are going to answer four questions. And the four questions that come into our mind is, is vitamin D supplementation necessary on a regular basis? Uh, whether there is a COVID infection or not? Will vitamin D supplementation actually uh, help a person from getting repeated respiratory infections? Uh, does, is there any proof of that? And uh, does it actually protect me from COVID? Is the question everyone would like to ask if I take vitamin D supplements. And in cases admitted to the hospital, uh, will therapy with vitamin D uh, help to prevent complications or uh, help uh, prevent patients getting into the ICU stage? Now, we are going to look into these things going through literature, what is available, and we're going to find out, uh, uh, will it help? That doesn't mean that I know the answers. People are searching for it. I'm going to present to you where the answers lie, what people feel, and I'm going to show you a surprise paper where the uh, results are uh, sort of very, very positive. And finally, uh, my, my talk will deal with optimizing your vitamin D levels. So the talk is in three parts. The first part being something about vitamin D we should all know about. The second part is the connection between vitamin D and the COVID epidemic, and whether vitamin D will help. And the last part will be about how to optimize your vitamin D levels, which is extremely important. So if I could go to the slides, uh, I could actually uh, walk you through what I'm trying to say and We'll have to then get on to, right. So what we have here is the graphic you can see, everybody's running around happy in sunlight. And that's why vitamin D is called the sunshine vitamin. And invariably you'll find that uh, if there is so much of sunlight around us, uh, why should we be deficient or are we deficient at all? Is there a deficiency problem? Uh, should we look into it? And I'm afraid the, the, the truth is that a large percentage of people actually are deficient. And I'll show you some statistics. But before talking about the deficiency bit, 
I think we should know a little bit of vitamin D and I would like you to know that it, it's actually a pro-hormone. A lot of people think it's a vitamin and it's not a vitamin. It's now the latest research shows it's a pro-hormone. It's got endocrine functions and it's also got autocrine functions. And invariably, a lot of people tend to forget that. And it's actually made by the human body. Nature, or God, if you prefer, created a situation where we got a machinery which can produce our own vitamin D, as long as you stay in sunlight. And uh, the problem, of course, is most of us don't do. And when vitamin D was studied, they found that it goes through a process of uh, going through the liver to get activated into the calcidiol part, that's 25-hydroxy uh, vitamin D. And then it has to go to the liver uh, where it is activated into calcitriol, which is the active form. That is what we thought in the past. But now we know that basically uh, every cell has got vitamin D receptors. And a lot of scientists actually wondered why. Why is every cell in the body having vitamin D receptors? It's because vitamin D is extremely important. And every cell uses vitamin D and it actually activates it. Calcidiol goes to every cell and it gets activated in the cell to the active uh, component. And why does the cell do that? Because that means vitamin D must be extremely important for the function of the cell. And to put it in, in a short way of explanation, what vitamin D is, it's a key. And if a cell has to do a particular job, it has to access the DNA. And to access the DNA, uh, the DNA library, so it can actually read the library and decide what it's to do, the stimuli comes in, it has to access the library, and vitamin D is the key. It's the key that actually unlocks the DNA library. And if it doesn't do that, the cell won't respond. It won't do anything at all. And that, so you realize that without the key, you know, you can't open your library door. So the significance of and the importance of vitamin D has now been recognized. And say, and we know that if you've got low levels of vitamin D, this can't happen and we are in trouble. So this is particularly showing you the range of deficiencies all over the world. And what we actually have today, even before the COVID epidemic or pandemic, we have a vitamin D pandemic. Is it being recognized? The sad part is that though doctors are realizing that it's happening, there are no governmental policies to tell us which way we should go and what we should do. The same thing of the prevalence of vitamin D deficiency in India shows the same pattern. And what we have here is basically the different kind of age groups that actually show up, showing that vitamin D is, is a problem in the elderly, of course, in the adults, of course, in the women, pregnant women, adolescents. Now, I thought most of the young people are outdoors getting enough sunlight. It looks like the modern era is caught up. We're sitting in front of the TV indoors all the time. And that is the basic problem. So we realize that vitamin D deficiency not only all over the world, globally it's about 40%. USA now, the statistics show that it's increasing dramatically. The rich country, people still vitamin D deficient. And what we have to see is, is there any kind of statistics on this? Are people collecting information? So this particular Vitamin E deficiency in India paper, which I'm showing you, being very randomly selected. And I selected it because it is very well written. It's from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. And I'm sure the students who are listening to this will get access to more of the stuff. And they said at the end of the paper that in India, vitamin D deficiency is widespread. We already saw that. Uh, critically diagnosed cases represent only the tip of the iceberg. And invariably, what we had to realize is that this burden can cause a lot of ill health and we need to actually do something about it and it has to be addressed. Now in this paper they've explained why Asians and Indians and people living in sunny places, why they have the deficiency. And some of the points they said is because 
Um, although there's so much of sunlight, people hardly go out. They wear clothes. We are shy. Asians are shy. We tend to cover ourselves most of the time. The Asian skin being of, of a darker nature needs a longer exposure to, to sunlight. And that also in particular hours, which you'll see later on. And, in, and that's not being done. The other thing is, of course, malnutrition and diet plays a part. And then ladies get pregnant very quickly. There's no much spacing. And finally, they said pollution can, can actually affect urban areas, a lot of pollution. It blocks the ultraviolet rays, especially the UVB, that is actually useful for making vitamin D. UVA is the harmful one. UVB doesn't cause any harm. It is the one that actually lands on your skin and you get vitamin D being made. And if the UVB, UVB is very easily blocked, by the way, uh, tissue paper can block it. So your clothes will certainly block it. So those are the kind of small reasons they are sort of said could be affecting the vitamin D status in India. And there are countries who are actually looking into it. And there's a latest report in, from Ireland, which talked about vitamin D and the implications for COVID-19. I'm just showing you this particular paper as an example to show that all over the world, people are taking vitamin D very seriously. And they are looking at the implications for COVID-19, like we are going to look at the implications in our talk. And what we have to uh, really realize is that all these are preliminary uh, guidances and these are not the guidelines. It does not come into official government policy in the majority of the countries. Uh, but they are, it just shows that you know we should start worrying about this problem. I put up the slide just to tell you um, and show you what the, the levels are. Uh, one is in nanograms per ml. This is what is basically used in the States. Then you got the nanomole per liter. This is generally what is used in the UK. Uh, it's just that if you multiply this by 2.5, you can actually convert this to this. The slide is mainly to show you, this is the deficiency level. Anything below 20 is deficient. 20 to 30 is called insufficient or insufficiency. A lot of uh, researchers and doctors believe that insufficiency also to be, should be taken seriously because we shouldn't wait for deficiency where that's what really causes rickets. Uh, insufficiency causes a lot of health problem because it causes a dysfunction. As we saw, the vitamin D is the key to the DNA. And if you've got insufficient vitamin D, the key doesn't work, the body doesn't work, and you're going to get problems. The novel, they said, is about 30. And then invariably, uh, when you see a report, if a doctor says it's about 30, they say it's fine. But uh, a new set of uh, researchers who are advocating vitamin D actually have different ideas, which I'll share it with you in a moment. Of course, people are worried about overdose and overdose is a problem. They say anything about 100 uh, nanograms of overdose and nobody can really get that actually. So what we actually hear is have another slide, which, which, which is from the people who are advocating the levels that they show should be changed. And they're saying deficient should be anything below 30. 30 is the, is the breakup mark. Insufficient should be 31 to 39. And actually everyone should be 40 to 80. Now, where did this come from? What we don't realize is that, uh, where did this idea come from that this should be the, the, the basic level? So they had a hypothesis that our ancestors who were in the sun all the time actually had this level. And how do we know today what the level should be? So these two photographs show the Hadza tribe here, the Maasai tribe there. So they went to Africa and got hold of this tribe. They're leading a very basic hunter-gatherer lifestyle. As you see, uh, they're exposing themselves to the sunlight and they are outdoors all the time and their levels were 40 to 60. So invariably, um, you don't go to up to 80, 40 to 60 is fine. And they said, okay, that is the level human being should be. And that's the level we function best. The other proof came from the fact that pregnant mothers, they give milk to their babies. If the milk should contain enough vitamin D to the baby, the mother should be at this level for her to have sufficient vitamin D in her milk. 
So that makes sense. Nature is always right. Finally, there is a relationship between vitamin D and the parathyroid hormone. If the vitamin D levels fall, it, it sort of acts on the calcium metabolism and parathyroid hormone goes up to regulate the calcium metabolism and bring it back to normal. So a higher level of parathyroid, we really don't want. And how do we prevent that? Well, we keep our vitamin D again to this magic figure. And that is where this magic figure came. Uh, everything tells us the figures generally accepted in, in, in the standard textbooks are not perhaps right. Well, I'm just giving you a viewpoint uh, and it is not yet confirmed. Well, that is true. So that's the first part of my introduction to, to vitamin D and, uh, and, and um, some of the basic things you need to know of. So invariably, to answer the first question, uh, should we take vitamin D supplements? Well, if you're not going out in sunlight all the time, invariably vitamin D levels in your body will be low. And uh, taking vitamin D on a regular basis could be a possibility. Second part of my talk was supposed to be on vitamin D levels and the COVID connection. So is there a correlation? Now, what they sort of tried to do is look into where did this COVID virus come from? And actually it is a zoonotic virus. It came from an animal, came to us, and it came in winter time at a particular latitude. So they said, okay, fine. Uh, maybe this winter cold and latitude is a connection. They went around all over the world getting statistics on that and found that, okay, there is a correlation. Then they found that uh, blacks and minority groups, especially the ones with dark skin, they are disproportionately affected. So they said, okay, they got dark skin. Maybe they're not making enough vitamin D. And we are talking about the modern humans who are, you know, indoors all the time. So they're not get, getting uh, enough sunlight either. They also found that the case fatalities, uh, a proportion of them, uh, was more seen more in, uh, in the elderly. And the elderly cannot make vitamin D, even if they stand out in the sun for a long time, the skin loses practically 75% of its capacity to make vitamin D. And invariably, the case fatalities were more in people with diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and having metabolic syndrome. And by a strange coincidence, all of them uh, have you know, low vitamin D. Now, remember that this is just a correlation. Correlation doesn't mean causation, but they made the connection. When they looked at the mechanism of action of vitamin D, they found that the, the regulation of immunity in viral infections and, and how vitamin D does that, especially when related to COVID, they found that it's got a lot of things it does. And, uh, and this has been uh, explained in detail in some other papers I'm going to show you. I'm not going to go into the details of how it does, but all we have to remember is that it seems to have uh, uh, something to do with the COVID virus by itself because it's a virus with an envelope uh, and uh, it, it tends to help block it. It tends to prevent it entry into the cell. And it also works, uh, the vitamin D works on the uh, RAS, the renin angiotensin system. And what the COVID virus does, it, it acts on what's known as an ACE2 receptor. It enters the cell through the ACE2 receptor and the ACE2 uh, receptor is very intimately connected with keeping the, the lung healthy, uh, the endothelium healthy, the vascular endothelium healthy, and it downregulates, it knocks off this receptor, uh, and then uh, it, that causes effects on the uh, renin angiotensin system, the renin levels go up, and vitamin D actually does the opposite. It actually upregulates the ACE2 receptor. So suddenly they made another connection. They said, okay, fine. If you give a lot of vitamin D to these people, it will sort of protect us because it's acting against the virus. It is killing the virus. It is upregulating uh, the ACE2 receptor. Maybe that can work. Now, all this is a hypothesis. Remember, they have done some rat experiments on the ACE2 receptor. And they found that to be true. But like I said, I'm just giving information. I'm just trying to let you think along the lines the others, the researchers are thinking. And they're basically saying that, okay, we have found so many associations, so many correlations. So maybe giving vitamin D is a good idea. So let's see if that is true. I just put this up just to sort of remind you of what vitamin D does. It's got what is known as immune regulatory uh, function. A lot of people think vitamin D is 
linked to calcium and the health of your bones and in osteoporosis. Uh, that's one part of the endocrine bit it does, but it's got uh, immune regulatory action it's being studied a lot. And we've got two types of immunity. We've got the innate immunity and we have got the adaptive immunity. And the innate immunity basically is the one that comes first into the picture when a pathogen like say COVID virus comes in, this immunity is, 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 is starts working, the macrophage is informed and it's involved in the dendritic cells are informed. And vitamin D is very important to go as a key to open up the macrophage, tell it what to do. And in addition to that, so that basically boosts the system, it produces a microbial protein called cathelicidin. And this is surprising that there is a microbial protein. And this protein actually works a lot on viruses which has got an envelope in it. And the COVID virus got an envelope in it. And what this does is it goes in and breaks the envelope up makes holes in it and the virus loses its particles and dies. So if you got enough vitamin D, this function is possible. Vitamin D also acts on the adaptive immunity and in the adaptive immunity, basically uh, what it does is it actually suppresses IL-6. A lot of cytokines are produced when, when a foreign pathogen comes, the body is trying to protect itself. It uses all the T lymphocytes and the B lymphocytes, the, the T helper lymphocytes, the, and all these uh, immune systems are kick-started. One of the problems is that you need a break. So when you know you send an army in with a lot of guns, a lot of collateral damage can take place. So when the immune system is working, you find that you know uh, a lot of cytokines are produced. And that's why you keep hearing about the cytokine storm. That's one of the problems with uh, COVID infection. Patient gets a cytokine storm, uh, the chances of recovery. Uh, drops quite a lot. So what vitamin D does it, it suppresses the, the IL-6 is one of the main, uh, important cytokines there. And, and so it's got a, a suppression, it acts like a break. And that's why it's called immunoregulatory. So it acts both ways. So I, I, I presented to you the hypothesis. I presented to you the correlations, the associations. So can we actually go ahead and say, hmm, maybe we should go go to the shop uh, and in India, you know, over-the-counter medicines are easily available and ask the person, give me a lot of vitamin D, I'll swallow it, and then I'll walk around without a mask. You, sorry, you can't do that. So there's a good Lancet paper to, who looks into it and they, and they caution us. They say that because there, there are all these studies which are showing associations, and uh, these are all observational studies and epidemiological studies, they look into the epidemiologies, collect the data, and try to you know compare and see if there is a correlation or association. That doesn't mean we have proved causation. For that, we need what is known as an RCT, a randomized control trial. Now, do we do randomized control trials? Well, the good news is about eight of them have been started recently. And uh, I told you I'll show you a surprise paper, uh, and I got one of them, which has got uh, some surprising results. So the fact is that those papers have to come out and until they come out, uh, we'll have to wait and, uh, and until it is evidence-based. The basic thing is I'm not giving medical advice here. What I'm trying to say is give you the information. So unless it comes out evidence-based, it's introduced into the protocol, only then it comes into the guidelines, that may take time. So the question of course is should we wait? And some people may say, we've got no time. The vaccine is taking time to come. Although there is a vaccine being prepared and going to phase three trial in Pune, and it's an Oxford, uh, London-based vaccine they made. So maybe, maybe the vaccine will come in. At the present moment, well, we have to stick with vitamin D. So when we talk about vitamin D and link it to respiratory infections, uh, do we have a paper on that? So this is a good paper in the BMJ. It looked at, you know, it's a systemic review. It's a meta-analysis. And what they do in a meta-analysis is, go in and take out all the information they have on vitamin D and they uh, present it out and uh, see. And they actually looked at about 11,321 patients and there were 25 eligible RCTs they looked into, uh, genuine good RCTs. And, and the conclusion was, uh, was that actually vitamin D can help. They said that vitamin D supplementation was safe. 
It protected against acute respiratory tract infection. They looked at both upper and lower respiratory tract uh, of all kinds. Uh, of course, COVID-19 was not in the picture there because basically that wasn't there at the time. And, um, and th there's a surprising thing they found in this paper. They said that daily doses and weekly doses were actually very helpful. But those getting bolus doses, you know, once in a month dose and, and a loading dose or a bolus dose, it didn't actually work. Uh, which is quite useful because a lot of GPs in India uh, have got a habit of uh, giving, you know, a loading dose once a month or something. I, I got an uncle of mine who, does, who takes that once in a month. So we really don't know if that is good because uh, the evidence is you should be daily doses or weekly doses. So that's what uh, uh, the, pre the paper which showed uh, it is protective for respiratory infections and most probably for COVID-19 because it's a respiratory infection. And this particular uh, bar chart is actually showing the severity of vitamin D level. And to the seriousness of the case, if you've got lots of vitamin D, you find that, you know, there are any very mild or asymptomatic infections. As the levels go down, uh, and this is done in about 212 patients they surveyed, uh, having very low levels, the chances of getting very severe infections grows up. Is it true? Well, let us look at some papers. So the evidence that vitamin D supplementation could reduce risk of you know, influenza and COVID and infection. This is a kind of a narrative paper that um, I found very interesting. Uh, and, and I found that they have actually looked at uh, so many things uh, uh, which included the mechanisms. It describes the mechanisms. So it's one paper which you students you know, are welcome to go and look at because it sort of describes in detail what I've been trying to say in a very concise form. Uh, and and it, it, it has a, a conclusion which is also uh, very positive. Uh, and what it says that the data I reviewed uh, shows the role of uh, higher uh, vitamin D concentrations, reducing the risk of infection and death from acute respiratory tract infections, including those from influenza, uh, coronavirus, and pneumonia. So they, they just taken this on onto COVID-19 and say, well, it will help in COVID-19 too. Why I like this paper a little uh, more than the others is because uh, they are uh, recommending um, the, the concentrations uh, of, of vitamin D, which are basically different from uh, the other sources. Uh, and um, they're also finding out that uh, uh, the concentration of 20 to 30 nanograms uh, reduce the risk of uh, acute respiratory infections, basically. And so that's a good paper to go to. And the amount they are asking to take uh, to achieve these, you know, the high levels of vitamin D is basically 2,000 to 5,000 international units. Now we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit later because the standard RDA they recommend is very, very low. And uh, like I said, researchers who advocate vitamin D, they're constantly telling us that, you know, that RDA is good enough to prevent rickets, but it's not uh, good enough to prevent uh, uh, respiratory tract infections. So then I go on to uh, a paper, which I find is quite amazing. This is paper has actually uh, not been published yet. So I just got, you know, uh, directly from uh, uh, the, the uh, search for what the person had given uh, as, as the initial part of his work. And this paper is actually from the Philippines. And what it basically looked at was, it looked at vitamin D level and the severity of all the patients who had COVID-19. So it went through um, a, a large uh, number of, of patients, nearly uh, multicentric uh, study was there, about 12 and 12 uh, cases was there. And they did what is known as a multinomial logistic regression analysis. It's a statistical analysis that looks at the odd ratio. And uh, the chart itself uh, shows that, you know, depending on the level of vitamin D, uh, very similar to the bar chart I showed initially, that the severity changes, it goes up. Yeah, the lower the level, the greater the severity. And if I talk about you know, statistical speech, 
the odds ratio they found uh, that for each standard deviation increase in serum D3, the odds of having a mild clinical outcome uh, increased by about uh, seven, it was about seven, seven times. And the odds of having a mild to critical outcome uh, was 19 times, which means that basically it protects you a lot. That if you have enough vitamin D, the chances of you getting a severe complication is reduced uh, by 19 times, which is pretty good. Uh, that's why I included this paper to show you that, you know, people are looking into uh, severity and connecting it to the vitamin D status. Uh, the other paper is another Indonesian study that is yet to be, you know, uh, coming out. It's gone for peer review. But I found that, you know, it's so good that I felt like including it. Uh, and they also studied um, a number of cases. Uh, and what they basically found was... Uh, uh, 780 cases were actually studied and it focused on identifying patterns of mortality and these people said how many people die and which is kind of an important question that comes to us that if I get COVID-19 what is the kind of patient uh, who for whom it is quite going to be dangerous and is going to die and they looked at this and found the majority of cases with deficient uh, vitamin D insufficient vitamin D levels died and uh, and the odds of death is higher in older males with pre-existing comorbidities. And this is what fact keeps coming up. And I think obesity was mentioned uh, as an important factor in COVID-19. Uh, and it is an important factor. Diabetes, hypertension, um, cardiovascular disease, all of them have low vitamin Ds. And the funny thing is, you know, this mentions older males. So on a sort of a happy note, if you are female and if you are young uh, and if you don't have any comorbidity, the chances are that the COVID virus won't really cause you know, uh, major problems in you. That doesn't mean you should go and get it. But uh, I like this paper very much because it sort of pinpoints because that is what people are worried about uh, all the time. So coming to, uh, uh, is there a treatment? Can we give vitamin D? Is there an RCT? So I told you that, you know, I'll have you uh, see a surprise RCT, which I kept um, for the last. And um, and this, this is, of course, um, peer reviewed, published. And what they found was they decided to give calcifediol instead of vitamin D3. And I told you to write down this calcifediol term. That is the particular uh, D3 that uh, is made in the liver. When the vitamin D3 goes to the liver, it is changed to this. And this has to be then activated. Uh, so they decided to give this form. Uh, I don't know why, but that's what they chose. Because a lot of studies show vitamin D3 in its original form doesn't work that well. And they gave it in a, a particular dose. These 76 patients were selected. And that's a very small number for an RCT and, you know, more larger numbers are required. Time will tell us. And it was done in the Reina Sofia University Hospital. And uh, they had a multidisciplinary committee that looked into it, selected the patients. And uh, there was intensivists, there was pulmonologists, internists, ethics committee members, you know, a lot of, lot of uh, people who made a team. So it was not just done, done for the heck of it. They did it very, very seriously. And what they found was, that the results are, are, are amazing. And uh, it was this committee that decided should a patient, uh, they were all hospitalized patients, the committee decided uh, should the patient go to the ICU or not. And invariably, they divided the 76 into two groups, as an RCT should do. And 50 patients were given calci calcifidiol, uh, and 26 were not given. And um, and what they did was uh, they looked at uh, what happened to these patients. And the surprising is the results show on the 50 patients on calcifidiol, there was only one ICU admission. So only one got serious enough to go to the ICU. And no one died. No deaths in that group. What about the 26 who didn't get the calcifidiol? They found that 13 had to go to the ICU and two died. And when you compare these results, when you look at the difference between the two groups, it's obviously very, very evident that vitamin D was doing something. 
So, which answers that question? Can vitamin D help? Well, this RCT actually says uh, it could. There should be more RCTs coming in. Uh, in the meantime, should I go and take some vitamin D? Well, to answer that question, I come to optimizing your vitamin D level, which I'm sure everybody's interested in, saying that, oh my God, vitamin D seems to be playing some part. Uh, maybe I should take some vitamin D. The first thing I should uh, request you to do is to, to always consult your family physician. Uh, if you can afford it, uh, it's an expensive test, get your vitamin D levels done. If you find that you are locked up uh, in a place 24 hours all the time, not getting enough sunlight, and you belong to what we know as uh, these two groups uh, or skin types, you know, there's a Fitzpatrick skin type chart. I just picked up what's relevant to us. Uh, Europeans have got white skin and they tend to need very little time in the sun to make vitamin D. Uh, we unfortunately need a little longer. So depending on whether you're type four or type five, you know, you need to uh, get your vitamin D from the sun. That's the cheapest way and the simplest way to get your, an optimized your level. You don't have to get the sun every day, uh, twice a week or even thrice a week is supposed to be good enough. And uh, how much of the skin should you should you expose? And that's important. Uh, you can't simply go fully clothed. You can't wear a burqa and stand in the sun. Nothing will happen. Uh, and which is a problem in India because we tend to generally cover ourselves up. Uh, and uh, you must think of, you know, privacy. Where can you go up? Maybe the terrace of a building. I don't know. You must think of ways in which you can get this. So that's important. The, the percentage of the side of the body you expose the sun to. The second thing is how long? Do you do stand the whole day? Uh, so the average is that for the skin types I mentioned, uh, about th 30 minutes, 25 to 30 minutes, uh, sunlight is good enough. But the time of the day seems to be important because the time of the day, morning 10 o'clock to afternoon 3 o'clock, that is where you get the best and the maximum amount of uh, the uh, ultraviolet B rays, UVB rays. Uh, although, you know, you may get it during other times too, it's a bit scattered. And which is why the, our ancients always said, go and do Surya Namaskar. And they did it in the olden days, you know, ne next to a river somewhere. And uh, most probably they exposed themselves uh, for enough of the time. And here you see that the minimum you should sort of expose is 11%. And that gives you about 1,000 units. If you want to go further up uh, and get more, you know, then you have to sort of start exposing a little more. About 17% is ideal, the neck and the hands and the full arms and the lower legs. Now this should be sort of problematic in women because basically you know, exposing lower legs in India is not possible. The full arms, uh, neck, hands, maybe a little bit of the face is okay. Although the face is not supposed to be good enough. Uh, you get about, about you know, 1000 units of international units of vitamin D. Uh, well, foreigners, if they actually expose full body, that is 100%, you know, they make a lot of vitamin D. They make about 5,000 units. And remember that the longer you stay, the more you make, but it stops around at 20,000 units. And let me remind you that 20,000 is not dangerous. Uh, the body knows what to do with it and it will stop making more vitamin D. So the, this is just to show you the recommended intake by the National Institute of Medicine. This is still in the textbooks and I don't know whether your textbooks and students' textbooks are showing this. These RDAs, now the latest research shows, may not be enough. So the endocrine society, you see vitamin D is now considered to be an endocrine chemical. So the endocrine society has sort of uh, adopted it as their own. And they recommend for adults, it should be around 1,500 to 2,000 is the kind of recommendation, you know, uh, I would go for. And if you take about 2,000 uh, international units per day, uh, that's fine. If you can combine it with a couple of days in the sun, uh, you'll hit the 4,000, which the other papers are mentioning. So uh, society also mentioned that sunlight is as important. So it's simply taking supplement is not the solution, but that's what you know I would go for. And that sort of answers the question. Uh, in fact, two questions. One is, uh, should I take uh, vitamin D supplements? Obviously, yes, there is a pandemic of vitamin D deficiencies, so you should especially if you're indoors and you cover yourself up. How much should I take? Uh, the amount I should take, you know, should be around 2,000. Uh, some people say, well, 
you know, if you want to protect yourself from respiratory infections, um, that sort of includes COVID, maybe you should take 4,000. I don't know. It is just information and it's not medical advice. So that sort of completes the answering of the questions that we were looking into. Uh, and I'm sure that, you know, there have been some lapses and while I was speaking, it's because there's so much information which, you know, I'm pushing into um, in a short period of time. But I would like to, you know, put into the fact that, you know, when, when a pathogen comes in and infects us, how do we treat it? Now, it is Louis Pasteur who actually introduced the germ theory. And this is the theory that everybody is quite aware of. And when the germ theory came up, uh, that is the problem that, uh, that Louis Pasteur was, you know, uh, a brilliant scientist and he discovered the germs and they, they went on to discover what will kill the germs. So we got the antibiotics and various modules and, and you know, drugs to, to do that. And that's what we've been doing all along. Then he had a rival called uh, Antoine Bichamp, and uh, he said that, you know, it's not as the pathogen that's important. He, he introduced the terrain theory. He said that it all depends on the person the, the pathogen is actually infecting, which makes a lot of sense because the COVID doesn't, you know, create serious illness in everybody. You find that it tends to, you know, pick, pick certain groups, and we discussed that. Uh, children are absolutely seem to be quite okay. Adults are okay. Youngsters are okay. They get to mild symptoms but they're fine um, on an average. So the person is so important, the terrain is so important. So it says that if you take an example of a fish and suppose the fish gets COVID, what you will do is, you know, put it in a plastic bag and do what is known as isolate the fish, maybe give it a mask, I don't know. And then we'll try to get, vaccinate the fish and give it some drugs. And that's our approach now. Uh, the vitamin D I discussed about is the approach about, you know, uh, improving the immunity of the fish and in improving the environment. And this is one area where, the, where you nutritionists will come in because you're the ones who are going to give guidelines and say that, you know, you have to have a healthy mind and healthy body. Maybe the fish uh, should also have a healthy mind. So it should be perhaps given a couple of extra fishes to swim around with, give a family of fish and put it into a bigger tank and uh, give it more oxygen, which is, uh, which is for the survival and give it fish food and not junk food. And maybe it should get some, some more sunlight, ask it to swim a little more higher here so the sun can hit it, get some vitamin D. Jokes aside, remember that looking after your body, looking after your mind and looking after the environment. And I think Swami has talked uh, a lot on this subject and he's always said that our ancient gurus knew how to live. Our ancient gurus knew how to eat and our ancient gurus knew how to live close with the environment you know and swami actually insists that you should walk around barefoot uh, as far as possible if you can and uh, and this sort of hygiene theory of killing all the germs and using that all everywhere actually lowers your immunity so that is what is important that we do have the vaccines we do have the drugs uh, we have to give them but in order to protect ourselves we must have the micronutrients and the macronutrients in the right balance. And that is where the nutritionists come in and not, not doctors. Doctors come in only in an emergency and should come in only in an emergency. It is the nutritionists who should take care about and talk about health, which is uh, your, your domain. And I request all of you to actually do it very, very seriously. Okay. So I leave you with, I find my happiness where the sun shines is. And I would say that... Uh, Basically, uh, the sun is life-giving and you must respect it. So I would like to thank, uh, thank uh, the whole team for giving me this opportunity to talk to you guys. And of course, I would always thank Swami. It was his uh, arrangement, the Sutradhari pulls the strings and that's why I'm here. And I hope that you found this helpful. Thank you, Sairam. Thank you, sir. It was a very informative talk. Though scientific, you made it quite simple for us to understand various important aspects of vitamin D, especially with respect to COVID-19 susceptibility. Thank you so much, sir, for the talk. We have a couple of questions from the viewers. Can we have them, please, with your permission? Oh, please. Thank you. Yeah. 
So the first question is, what are the sources of vitamin D and how do we maintain vitamin D levels in the body? Oh, brilliant. Uh, I think I just didn't answer this question in my talk because I knew this would come up. Uh, you see, for vegetarians, very difficult. 90% yes. of vitamin D has to be made from sunlight or you have to take supplements. Vegetarians can't get it from food. No way. Uh, mushrooms. Mushrooms contain vitamin D. So if vegetarians, you can, you're allowed to eat mushrooms. A lot of people don't like mushrooms under the ground. So they don't consider it vegetarian. But you have no choice. Very sad. You have to be in sunlight. That's what most of our Indians were doing. You know, we were all outdoors all the time. In fact, in my grandmother's and great grandmother's days, cooking was done outside. We children were playing outside. We were not allowed in the house, only to sleep. Otherwise, we were kicked out. And I wondered why. And you know, my mother, mother and grandmother used to put coconut oil on my body and make me run around, you know, outside. So um, maybe, you know, it's all because of vitamin D. But today we are all indoors and we are wrapped up. So, so I'm sorry to say, uh, Non-vegetarian food uh, does give a little bit, I mean, not the amounts we are talking about. It gives a little bit of the RDA amounts. So if you eat non, a lot of non veg food, it can get the RDA, but it can't get 2000 units. Again, you need sunlight, of course. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Thank you sir. Uh, sir, another question is, is it advisable to take vitamin D supplements over natural sources? Uh, natural sources are not available. Uh, if, if you are getting enough sunlight, Yes. You don't need, see, the basic thing is, you know, sun is our mother and, and, and it does the job. So, you know, God made us that way. You make your own vitamin D, go to the sun. Now, if you're not doing that, that's why you need supplements. You know? And then, of course, if you find that you're pregnant and you're lactating and, and the pediatricians will look at the children and, you know, test their vitamin D. So, ideally, the vitamin D has to be tested. Uh, it's too expensive. So, in India now, they've done the survey. India is a pandemic. Yes. And remember that there's no toxicity for vitamin D. The toxicity for vitamin D is 10,000 units per day. Yes. No one will take 10,000 units per day. <laughs> it, is, it is actually silly. So um, uh, there's a lot of a misunderstanding that, you know, vitamin D can be toxic. Of course it can be toxic. You take a whole bottle or something. But uh, if, you, if you take, uh, and the endocrine society says that, you know, the upper limit of normal, uh, they said even up to 4,000, they said, the upper limit of normal, if you take 4,000 per day, nothing is going to happen. And the toxic level, they said, uh, is 10,000. And that should be about 150 nanograms. Our normal should be around 40 nanograms. 40. So we are trying to hit that 40, 30 to 40 range and mm -hmm. not reach 150. So, and it will never reach 150. <laughs> but like I said, uh, medical guidance is required. You can't simply go to the shop and start swallowing. Uh, but yes. if you swallow these small minimal amounts, uh, nothing will happen. Okay. I yes. Thank you so much, sir. I thank you once again thank for you. conducting a wonderful and informative session. I hope the viewers have gained a lot of insights from your talk. Thank you. Thank sir. you, Saira.